This is a bad idea. My best friend, Alfie, was yelling in my ear above the pounding music. This is beyond a bad idea. This is such a bad idea that the horror movie protagonist creeping around the haunted mansion in her underwear with nothing but a flickery flashlight would stop, look you dead in the eye, and tell you that this is a stupid, terrible, horrible, bad idea. I felt some of Alfie's beer slosh down the front of my shirt. As usual, he couldn't hold his drink. We were crammed like sardines into the sticky basement of the least rundown bar in my hometown, and I just finished telling Alfie that I was going to a remote town in the Pyrenees Mountains to look for my father. I remember his response verbatim, because as it turned out, I should have heeded his advice. But that came later. For the moment, I was trying to make Alfie understand that while my father hadn't disappeared, not quite, I still felt like I was owed an explanation. My father, Jamie, had been a professor of sociology, a hard-working man who always came home smelling like orange peels, chalk, dust, and desk polish. For most of my childhood, I remember him being quiet, kind, and fair. What he did to our family when I was a teenager, though, was anything but... My father's area of study was medieval witchcraft, and his views on the topic were controversial. The scholarly consensus about the thousands of witch trials that plagued Europe was that they were a result of small-town feuds, mass hysteria, hallucinogenic fungi in the food supply, or some combination of the three. My father, however, had a different opinion. He was convinced that, Despite the exaggerations and persecutions, there had to be a grain of truth at the bottom of it all. His career was spent proving that a cult of witches, or at least people who believed they were witches, had really existed and persisted up to the present day. The hunt for evidence to back up such an extraordinary claim led him to obscure locales around the world, but he always came back with a lot of stories, local sweets, and a sunburn on his beaky nose until his last trip. A few days before my father was due back from Spain, almost 20 years ago now, we received a letter postmarked Madrid. In it, my father described how he'd fallen in love with his research assistant. He was moving to the mountains for a simpler life, and that, although he was very sorry, he was sure we'd understand, and that it was all for the best. The handwriting was my father's, but the message wasn't like him at all. We were all sure that something terrible had happened. The authorities involved dragged their feet, not wanting any part of a messy international domestic dispute. They responded to my mother's hysterical pleas with pity, not concern. When the local Basque authorities confirmed that my father was indeed alive and well in a small Pyrenees town, the case was closed. It might not seem fair, they told my mother, but people have a right to start over and be forgotten. After that, my hatred of my father knew no bounds. I destroyed the gifts he'd given me, changed my last name, majored in history, and dedicated my doctoral thesis to disproving any historical basis for the evidence of witchcraft. So my father had destroyed my family, I would destroy his life's work. My presentation had been a resounding success, and I was back in my hometown, hence Alfie in the bar, to celebrate. My mother took advantage of my visit for some help with chores around the house, one of which was disposing of the few cardboard boxes of my father's things that we still had stuffed away in the back of the closet. I could take anything I wanted, my mother shrugged, and ditch the rest. There wasn't much left, but... It brought back memories. The tackle box from our first fishing trip, ticket stubs from movies we'd seen together lovingly preserved in a folder. It was hard to imagine that a man who would keep such things could have just abandoned us. I also found his final postcard, a sun-bleached hilltop town with a crumbling bell tower in its center, surrounded by pine trees and snowy mountains. What if I went, I told myself, what if I finally got some closure? 
What if this was what I needed to open a new chapter in my life? I checked the faded print beside the stamp. Lapixuri, Navarra, España. I had a location. All that I needed was a plane ticket. Once that was bought, I headed out for a blurry night with my high school friends. The only part of which I really remember was Alfie's drunken prophecy. Four weeks later, I was in Madrid. Then it was a train, a bus, another bus, and a two mile slog of the unmarked stop where the river dropped me off. As the dusty door closed, he shot me a strange look, halfway between fear and pity. Then I was left alone in the steep, zigzagging road that led up to Lapixuri. My dad's postcard was from the 90s, but it was eerie how little the town had changed. Weathered bone white houses, narrow stone streets, the crumbling bell tower. The room I'd rented was one of only three options in the whole region and the only one where English was spoken. The owner, Ergskin, was a big, energetic woman in her 50s who spent her youth in London and had decorated her rural Basque home with images of double decker buses, police booths, and everything British. It was surreal to sit beside the hearth of a sunken medieval antechamber and sip tea in front of a giant painting of Winston Churchill with a bulldog. With a few hours of daylight left to kill, I decided to take a walk around town. Old men in slouch hats and unbuttoned shirts, playing cards or putting along in rusty tractors. Shawl wrapped grandmothers carrying baskets of vegetables. Bored teenagers in fake leather jackets, huddled on street corners, smoking. I received a lot of hand waves and short, curious conversations on my stroll. People in the Pixery seemed welcoming, even if we didn't share a language, but also watchful. Like they expected something terrible to happen to me at any moment and didn't want to miss it when it did. The language barrier was actually a blessing in disguise. I hoped to avoid any questions about what I was doing in La Pixery. If people knew my true purpose, it might affect what I could learn from them. Even worse, someone might tip off my father before I could confront him. Besides, I wanted to see for myself what made this sleepy town worth abandoning a family for. When the sun set, the temperature plummeted and a howling night wind blew down from the mountains. The stone walls were thick, however, and the wood-fired hearth heated my room marvelously. I expected to sleep deeply after so many days of travel, but I saw something just before I closed my eyes that disturbed my rest all night. As I took my last glance out my room's high medieval window, I saw something darker than the starless sky scamper away from the ledge. Whatever it was, it had been watching me. Who knew for how long? Maybe it was just the black cat. But what was it doing on a window ledge two stories up from the street? I set out early the next morning. I'd written down the local sites that my father had deemed especially important, and my plan was to use them as a rough guidebook, walking from spot to spot and asking the locals, as incoherently as possible, about the other weird foreigner who seemed so interested in these forgotten places. Walking down the foggy dirt roads, I kept imagining that I'd suddenly turn a corner and see a weathered figure with familiar round glasses and a sunburned nose leaning on his hoe, content with the morning's work. Would he recognize me? I was so lost in thought that I nearly fell into the first sight my father had mentioned. Sogin Ohaska, the witch's well. The road twisted and I found myself in a shady hollow, about to step into a fissure so deep I couldn't see the bottom. Spring water dampened the dark stone and filled the gulch with colourful flowers. I recognised Belladonna, Mandrake, Henbane and others that, according to my father, the witch cults used in their rites. Some had been harvested just a few days ago. I shivered, and not just because of the cool air of the valley. There was no good reason to be collecting those plants in those quantities 
unless you wanted to poison quite a lot of people, or at the very least, make them hallucinate for weeks on end. Even later, eating lunch beside a golden field with white-capped mountains all around me and the warm sun on my face, my thoughts went back to the neatly snipped plants of that gloomy grotto. I felt a presence behind me while I ate. I spun around to see a tired, hungry donkey just a few feet away. It was just standing there, staring at me, but there was something unsettling about his big, pitiful brown eyes. The sadness in them seemed almost human. A farmer came by to shoo the poor beast off, and I was finally able to ask a couple indirect questions about my father. Yes, he confirmed. A guy like that had come to town a while back. He lived nearby with a young lady, but they had since moved on. He wasn't sure where. My heart sank. If my father had moved without leaving a forwarding address, how would I ever find him? I reminded myself that this was just one farmer's opinion. It might be wrong. Maybe they just moved to the next village over, and so on. Even so, my heart was heavy as I set out for my next objective. Eremu Beltzak. The Black Plains. Local legend held that it was the meeting place of the witch cult, and my father considered that the disuse of such prime grazing and planting land was proof enough that something very disturbing happened there. As I passed the last of the old stone farmhouses, the road narrowed to a trail that zigzagged through the pine forest before the last opening to the plains. The view was probably spectacular, but it was already dusk and low clouds were quickly covering the fields with fog. I'd planned a circular route back to town, so it was either cross the plains or retrace my steps in the dark. I swallowed my fears, adjusted my headlamp, and set out into the cloud-covered field. The trail disappeared almost immediately. To make matters worse, the reflection of my headlamp of the fog made it impossible to see more than a few feet in any direction. Not only could I no longer find my way forward, but I could no longer find my way back. And if anything was skulking out there in the dark, my tiny headlamp would appear brighter than a lighthouse beam. No matter where I looked, it was the same hippie grass and opaque mist. I tried to keep from panicking, telling myself that as long as I walked in a straight line, I'd come to the end eventually. But in practice, it wasn't so easy. I had to scramble around ditches and boulders as I went, and it soon became impossible to tell which direction I was going. From down in town, the plains hadn't looked this big, between the damp and the wind, my teeth began to chatter. I took refuge behind a boulder and consulted my GPS, but the signal was dead. Finally, I got it together enough to proceed. I was nearly knocked off my feet by a black shape that went flying past. Even now, I tell myself it was probably just a cow fleeing the rain clouds, but between the fog and my frayed nerves, it was hard not to see the black shrouded form of an old crone. Her eight foot tall frame bloated with gluttony and wrinkled like a rotten apple. I felt sure she looked at me with a single black pupil and left behind the reek of rotten meat. Other dark shapes whipped through the fog. I couldn't be sure how many. By then, I was running for all I was worth, paying no heed to twisted ankles and slips in the mud. I didn't stop until I found a tree line, and then, somehow, the dirt road that led to Lapixuri. My landlady, Erskine, panicked when she saw the state I was in, limping, shivering, and soaked in mud. She insisted I take a hot bath, and it wasn't until I sank in the tub that I realized how sore I was. I'd had a narrow escape from getting lost in the mountains, and perhaps from something else as well. I didn't mention what I'd seen to her, more from embarrassment than anything else. Sitting here, neck deep in hot water, surrounded by thick stone walls, it was easy to imagine that what I'd seen had been a huge product of some lost cattle 
and my overactive imagination. And so I thought. I climbed into bed with a groan, wondering what my next day in Lapidzuri would bring. The wind still howled outside, but no dark shapes haunted my window that night. I did, however, have the most frightening, realistic dream of my life. If indeed, it was a dream. It started with the rattling of Erskine's keyring and the heavy wooden door creeping open. As it did, several figures in hooded black robes scurried into the room. I say scurried because they crawled on all fours, although I could tell by the moonlight, aged skin of their hands and bare feet that were definitely human, at least in form. They disappeared from view, huddling at the foot of the bed, or maybe under it. I felt the rustling of the sheets being lifted, my socks were pulled off, and I felt the strange sensation of some kind of ointment being rubbed into my soles, and one of the hands doing the rubbing had at least six fingers. I didn't run, I was too sore to move, half sure that I was dreaming, and if that weren't enough, I was also scared stiff. Yet, as the hooded, crawling figures finished their disquieting work, a feeling of relaxation flooded me. I was being carried with them, up into the air, out the tiny window toward the night sky. Beneath twinkling stars, the winds carried us to Enemu Beltzak, and even with the lights of Labixuri and the toy-sized pine trees far below, I was not afraid. Not until the witch's sabbath started in earnest. Glowing, fiery orbs circling the field provided light. A blind orchestra wrapped head to toe in black cloth provided music. We descended from the sky to a set of tables set with food that ranged from five-star luxury fare to rotting trash. I was lowered to one of the latter tables. At the furthest point from the field from me, an enormous black he-goat sat atop an enormous throne of twisted black wood, and when its glowing red eyes landed on me, I felt compelled to eat. It didn't matter that the dead rats in front of me were swarming with still living maggots, or that the potatoes were green with mould. I ate. I ate like it was the best meal I'd ever tasted. I ate with a mad grin, like there never was and never would be any purpose to life except to gorge myself on the filth in front of me. At the high table, just below the he-goat's throne, I recognised the bloated witch, the farmer I'd met while having lunch, and my father. He raised a golden goblet in toast to me, then clicked his hooves gleefully. After dinner came the dance. I don't have words to describe the writhing, ecstatic way we came together as one flesh and I doubt any reader has the stomach to read through it. At some point, I drifted off into the sleep of the exhausted. When I awoke the next morning, I wasn't sure if the ache I felt in my whole body was a result of my exertions the day before, or what had happened during the night. I wondered why my socks were off and laying at the foot of my bed. The moment I set foot on the stone floor, I knew I wouldn't be doing any exploring it was hard enough to hobble downstairs and eat breakfast. If Erkskin knew anything about what had happened during the night, she gave no sign. After some strong coffee, I recovered enough strength to try my plan of last resort. I go down to the town hall and ask directly about my father. Walking into the quiet marble hall, I expected to run into the same stubborn bureaucrat who my mom had struggled with all those years ago. Instead, I saw a girl about my age in a smart grey suit, hanging tourism posters beside an enormous desk. She was so focused on her work that I felt bad for interrupting her. Can I help you? She asked in perfect English. Um, I began. How had she known I was there? Much less what language I spoke. News seemed to travel fast in Lepixuri. I'm looking for my father. Dr. Richard Shearer, she finished for me, turning around with a smile. The man who put us on the map. This was too much. How had she known my father's name? His books and the photos in them breathed a little life into this sleepy old town, 
hardly a tourist comes by who doesn't mention wanting to hike the mountains from Dr. Shearer's posters or search for the, you know, witches, she laughed. My name is Carmen Braggio, and I'm a great admirer of your father's. I'm Julian, Julian Chenault, well, formerly Shearer. Did you ever meet him? My father, I mean. I wasn't at all prepared for the direction this conversation was taking. No, I was just the girl when your father came to visit us. Carmen's face clouded. He didn't stay for long. Do you have an address? I gushed. Hmm, let's see. Carmen returned to the huge desk and searched through some filing cabinets. Here it is, 28C, Zaretta. But it's been vacant for almost eight years now and... She scrunched up her brow, frowning. There's no forwarding address or any further information. Just a note that the owner moved and donated their home to the municipality. All paperwork in order. I was hoping to meet him here. I trailed off. It had all been a waste. I'd be going home sore, uneasy, and with even more questions than I'd left with. It made me want to hit something. Preferably my father. If only I could find him. The anger and disappointment must have been written all over my face, because Carmen gave my arm a little squeeze. I'm sorry, she sympathised. It's been a while since you've spoken to Richard, hasn't it? Ten years, I grunted. Not a word. Well, Carmen put a finger to her lips thoughtfully. I have access to a government vehicle. I could drive you up to visit your father's former home, at least. Who knows? Maybe you'll find some sort of... clue. She grinned, like we were children playing some kind of detective game. Only if you want, of course. Five minutes later, we were bouncing up a dirt track toward the mountains. The wind blew through the open jeep, making Carmen's raven hair swirl around her face. She noticed me looking and smiled. I blushed and turned away toward the icy peaks. I finally understood how someone might fall in love in a place like this. My father's former home was far above the village, even above Eremu Beltzak and the pine forests. It must have been the summer home of some prosperous shepherd nestled as it was among the boulders beyond the tree line. We rolled through the fast-flowing mountain stream and parked just in front of the two-story stone structure. The wood shutters were closed and the place had started to show signs of abandonment at least on the outside. The views were majestic, but after a few walks around the property, I didn't learn anything I hadn't known before. Carmen stood beside the jeep, hands stuffed into the pockets of a jacket against the chill wind until I returned. Any luck? she asked. I shook my head. You know, she added slyly, the house belongs to the city government. I have a key. In the dark and dusk, we found some furniture covered by bedsheets, unimportant papers scattered on the floor, some fruit preserves that had long spoiled, and some wine that hadn't. There was a whole separate wing of the house, but even with two of us pushing, the old wooden door wouldn't budge. I looked around helplessly. Carmen held up the bottle of wine. We shouldn't let any of this go to waste, at least, right? I got a fire going in the hearth while Carmen washed out two cobwebby glasses in the stream and brought up some bread and cheese from the jeep. We curled up in the blankets we found and clinked glasses. Out the front door, the late afternoon valley opened up before us. Maybe it was the adventure of it all, or the intimacy of the fire, or the strength of the wine, but I told more than I meant to. About why I'd come, about my relationship with my father about how I didn't know who I'd be without his great and terrible shadow hovering over me. There was something else that had been bothering me, something about the house, about what we'd found. It was there in the back of my head, like an itch I couldn't scratch. I looked into Carmen's eyes, as dark as the Sorgan Ohaska. She'd been so patient with me, so kind. Whatever it was, it could wait. I leaned in for a kiss. Carmen pulled back. Aren't you going to finish your wine first? She whispered. 
I shot what was left without a second glance. Carmen stood up. I wondered woozily where she was going, but when I tried to follow, my legs wouldn't move. I looked at them stupidly. They felt like two useless logs disconnected from my body. I tried again. Nothing. As my vision started to blur, I remembered what had seemed strange to me before. There wasn't any dust on the wine bottle. It had been brought to the house recently. And why did my tongue feel numb? I tried to ask Carmen about it, but my mouth wouldn't work either. Carmen knelt down in front of me. She lifted one of my arms, then let it drop. Apparently satisfied, she strolled me to the door that led to the remainder of the house and opened it with a single twist of a hidden latch. Hooking me under the armpit, she dragged me like a sack of grain into the other wing, which I soon discovered was by no means abandoned. I can't swear by everything that happened next, as before, I was drugged, this time so heavily that I'd been paralyzed. But still, I insist there is a grain of truth to what I saw. Carmen tied me to a chair with black silk ropes and draped me in a red robe with a tall peaked hood. She then proceeded to kindle the hearth, light five black candles, and spread a red tablecloth over a long table. At its head was a throne of twisted wood that I thought I recognized. This done, she placed a small black cauldron to boil, adding water, herbs, and fat to make an ointment. At first, I couldn't see where the fat was coming from. As the fire glowed brighter, however, I recognized the source. A preserved human corpse. Only the head, torso, and one arm were left. Yet even after so many years, I recognized my father immediately. You did say you wanted to meet him again, didn't you? Carmen smirked. Well, here he is. Enjoy your family reunion while you can. She continued to prepare the room for whatever was to come, stopping only to pour some more wine in my feeble, dribbling mouth. The guests didn't begin to arrive until after sunset. They exchanged a set of words I didn't understand, like an incantation, before stepping into the room. A tall, obese grandmother, a middle-aged bald man with six fingers on each hand, a boy with lifeless eyes and slick back black hair. These and many others passed by me, removed their clothes and anointed themselves with Carmen's brew before taking a seat at the table. Finally, Carmen joined them as well, but not before leading a huge black goat to the place of honor. I was in no condition to take note of their rights or conversation, even if I could have understood it. I felt like I was flying high above the twisted scene, surrounded by half-formed fiends who mocked and twirled me helplessly around the shadows of the ceiling. A few things, however, are clear to me. Firstly, the rite was almost like a reenactment of my visions from the night before. If the witches had dosed themselves in the same ointment that they rubbed on my feet overnight, no doubt they were having the same terrifying euphoric hallucinations that I had experienced. Secondly, this was some kind of initiation for Carmen. Unlike the others, she was clothed, wearing a simple white robe. She sat at the furthest point from the black he goat, barely eating bland food while the rest gorged themselves. A determined look burned in her dark eyes. She wanted to prove herself. Lastly, a phrase. As a Galerian, Ume kept coming up. It was always met with raucous laughter and sideways glances toward where I sat drooling in my ridiculous attire. It occurred to me that I wasn't there as some kind of sacrifice. I was there as a joke. A final prod at the man who they called Arazagal, the troublemaker, I later learned. I was Arazagalerian Umea, the troublemaker's son, and they didn't seem to care if I lived, died, or told the world about them. Who would believe me anyway? Slowly, the feeling of flying faded. With an almighty effort, I realized that I could twitch my toes and fingers. 
the poison was wearing off, and Carmen was too focused on the ceremony to notice. Despite my desperate urge to flee, I forced myself to stay calm and wait for more strength to return. Soon, even my legs responded, and my left ankle was so slick from the heat that I could even slip it free from the black ropes. Around the table, the witch's chanting was rising to a high point. The obese grandmother and the six-fingered man stood on the table, stomping along with a chant as it rose to a crescendo. I chose my moment carefully. Just when the ecstasy reached its peak, I kicked myself into a standing position, aimed for the door, and promptly fell over. The drug clearly hadn't faded as much as I thought. Carmen shot me a look of irritation before tying me with more black ropes. She snipped off my clothes and hung me from the rafter in front of the hearth like a pig waiting to be slaughtered. It was so hot that the sweat dripping down my naked back sizzled when it dripped under the flagstones below. It occurred to me that maybe I'd been wrong about not being a sacrifice. After what felt like forever, Carmen closed in. She reached into the steamed cauldron of ointment and began to spread it all over me, chanting as she went. The rest of the cult repeated after her in a diabolical chorus. As she finished smearing the goop around the top of my head, I finally understood what Carmen's test had been. It all went back to the herbs collected from the Sorgonahuska. This was a test of Carmen's ability to make the poisons, hallucinogens, and other brews that the witch cult used in its rites. I was horrified to think what the effect of this final, full-bodied toxin might be. I didn't have to wait. The witches watched me from the other side of their long table, calm as doctors attending an autopsy, when my whole body began to shake and spasm. They nodded to one another approvingly. The slick-haired boy grinned and squeezed Carmen's shoulder, congratulating her. I felt my muscles twitching, stretching and shrinking, like my body was being twisted into some horrible new form. I blacked out. The smell of damp hay and feces. It was that cool blue hour just before dawn, and I was in a stable. I felt a cane lash against my back. I snorted and pushed myself to my feet with all four. Hooves? I tried to scream. I brayed and whinnied instead. My face was stretched, my back extended. Everything felt wrong, but there was no time to panic. The farmer struck mercilessly with his cane until I trotted out into the field, where the first load of the day was bound to my back. Firewood, bricks and construction tractor parts, tools and animal feed, up the hill and back down again, with a cane never far behind. I tried to catch a glimpse of myself in a roadside creek, but I looked away immediately. It was too horrible. Even worse were the mocking grins of Carmen and the other witches when I passed them on the streets of Labixuri. I thought about the other beasts I'd seen in town. How many had once been men like me? Not that there was time to think. Each overburdened step became a struggle not to fall, and when I was finally led to the filthy paddock, I collapsed immediately into slumber. Days blurred into weeks, each the same as the last. I came to know each rut of the road all too perfectly as I hauled loads for half the village. It felt like it would never end. Until one morning, I felt a prodding in my very human ribs. It was a police nightstick, a flashlight shone in my eyes, someone was yelling in a foreign language. I was laying naked, half starved and delirious on a city park bench. I didn't find out that I had been dumped in Pamploma until I saw the city name above the police station as I was being taken in for booking. Unsurprisingly, the blood test revealed that I had been heavily drugged. The problem was convincing the police that I hadn't done it to myself. My tale about being used by a cult for the nightmarish initiation rite didn't hold up. I knew how fantastical it sounded, but it was the truth, and I thought that meant something. It came down to my word against that of the local authorities in Lapigzuri. 
who not only denied everything, but also claimed I was wanted for being under the influence of drugs in public there as well. There was never any question about who the police were going to trust. As far as the legal system was concerned, I was just another junkie tourist. There was a horrible waiting period while the authorities debated the merits of charging me with public nudity and public intoxication versus letting me off with a fine to avoid all the paperwork. In the end, laziness won out, and over a month after I'd left, I was on a plane back home. I don't know why I feel compelled to share this story. After the sneers of the police, my academic co-workers, and even my friends and family, perhaps I just want to be believed. Perhaps rather, my story is a warning. If you go looking for the strange and mysterious, you just might find it. And the world out there is stranger than we ever dared to dream.